and welcome. You're watching UTV Live at 6. Good evening. These are the headlines. The trial of an 80-year-old former soldier in connection with the Troubles shooting begins in Belfast. The Brexit minister calls for Europe to respond to protocol demands as the DUP warns the clock is ticking. What I want to see is uh, a clear action taken by the government to restore Northern Ireland's place within the UK internal market. I think that is entirely possible. And tighter controls on bonfires could be on the way if a Sinn Féin motion is passed by Belfast City Council. Also tonight, it was a weekend of thrills and spills for Jonathan Ray as he recovered from two crashes to win in Portugal. And tomorrow's set to turn drier and brighter, but it will become more unsettled as we head towards the end of the week. I'll have the full forecast later in the programme. The trial of a former soldier who denies attempted murder has heard there's overwhelming evidence that he intended to kill an innocent and vulnerable man who posed no threat. Eight-year-old Dennis Hutchings from Cornwall is accused of killing John Pat Cunningham in 1974. Opening their case, the prosecution told the court Mr Cunningham had the mind of a child and died after being shot in the back as he ran away from an army patrol in County Tyrone. Sarah O'Kane reports. Well, if we can just go through here. Shaking hands with supporters, former soldier Dennis Hutchings made his way into court for the start of his trial. Mr Hutchings from Cornwall was accompanied by Conservative MP and former British Army officer Johnny Mercer. The 80-year-old is charged with the attempted murder of John Patrick Cunningham, who was shot dead as he ran away from an army patrol near Ben Burb in County Tyrone over 40 years ago. Mr Hutchings has already pleaded not guilty. There is no jury in this trial and today the prosecution opened their case. In court, Mr Cunningham was described as a vulnerable adult with the mind of a child. He had a fear of army personnel and if confronted by soldiers, he was likely to run away and hide. The court heard Mr Cunningham posed no threat and was asked to stop or halt before being shot. The judge was told Mr Hutchings, a former member of the Lifeguards Regiment, is accused of attempted murder because there is no forensic evidence to identify which bullets struck Mr Cunningham. The prosecution told the court this is a circumstantial case, that John Pat Cunningham was an innocent man running away and there is a compelling case that Dennis Hutchings fired three shots at close range and the court will hear overwhelming evidence that he intended to kill. The judge is expected to begin hearing evidence on Wednesday. Sarah O'Kean, UTV Live. The UK can't wait forever for the EU to reach agreement on the Northern Ireland Protocol, the government's Brexit minister has warned. Lord Frost told the Conservative Conference in Manchester that triggering Article 16 may be the only way to sort out the problems caused by the trade border in the Irish Sea. Our political editor Tracy McGee reports from Manchester. Is Boris Johnson hurtling toward a clash with the EU or the DUP over the Northern Ireland Protocol? Well, the government's Brexit man, Lord Frost, had tough words for the EU today. So I urge the EU to be ambitious. It's no use tinkering around the edges. We need significant change. If we can agree something better, as I would like us to do, we can get back to where we want it to be. An independent Britain with friendly relations with the EU based on free trade. But we cannot wait forever. Without an agreed solution soon, we will need to act using the Article 16 safeguard mechanism to address the impact the protocol is having in Northern Ireland. And what does the Prime Minister think? Well, I can certainly tell you is that uh, the protocol isn't working. It's no good uh, in its current uh, shape. Uh, it, it's being interpreted in a way that I think is inimical to the interests of, uh, of business in Northern Ireland, of uh, inimical to the interests of uh, people who care about our, our unions. It's crazy, you can't get kosher food in, uh, in Northern Ireland. You, there are, you can't get cancer, uh, cancer drugs about having, okay. we're already moving them across. We've got to fix it. If we can't fix it, I'm afraid, uh, you know, protocol shapes up or ships out. 
Conservatives are delighted to be in Manchester for their conference after a two-year break due to COVID. For them, there's a sense that they've got Brexit done. But away from the main event, unionist leaders shared a platform to voice their opposition to Brexit's side effect, the Northern Ireland Protocol. And I say to the Prime Minister, Prime Minister, you signed, you put this protocol upon us. The onus is on you to undo the greatest wrong ever done to the people of Northern Ireland. Are you up for it? Are you going to do it? Or is perfidity going to rule? The DUP leader met with the Prime Minister this morning and again warned without action from the government he will pull his ministers out of Stormont. We can't go on indefinitely with a situation where day and daily this protocol becomes embedded, is harming our relationship with the rest of the UK, is harming business uh, and uh, it, 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 it removes our equal rights as part of the United Kingdom. Um, I think that can be avoided. I think it, uh, we can get to an outcome where the government acts and does so in a way uh, that uh, addresses the issues uh, and the problems that we have. But the ball is now in the government's court. But while unionism agrees the protocol is its common enemy, it differs on its tactics to remove it. I do not think collapsing the institutions is good for Northern Ireland. I do not think it is good for the people. And I know um, that I will be at odds with my fellow unionists on this. But I cannot look at the people in the face, those 300 odd thousand uh, on hospital waiting lists, and say we're going to collapse an institution that's going to collapse an institution uh, that's, that's supposed to be looking after you. I, I just simply cannot, and I will not. So while Conservatives are enjoying being together and focusing on post COVID priorities, in the background, time is ticking down to a Northern Ireland Protocol showdown. But with who? Well, let's join Tracy live in Manchester. It would appear the government is inclined to take on the EU then over the protocol. Yes, tough words from Lord Frost today, but it has to be said we've heard this song from the government before. The protocol could work if the EU operated it in a common sense way, but since it's not, they're going to have to decide whether or not to trigger Article 16. The question is, does the government actually mean this or is this more posturing? I thought it interesting today that the DUP leader, Sir Geoffrey Donaldson, said at that fringe event that after his meeting with the Prime Minister, he was greatly encouraged DUP sources saying that uh, the Prime Minister does not want to see Stormont collapse and so wants to engage in some sort of process to sort this issue out. The difficulty for the DUP is they've heard this song before and the question is whether or not the government will translate these words if Boris Johnson can be trusted to turn those words into actions. And how has Lord Frost's warning then been received? Well, the EU have said that despite what they describe as Lord Frost's lyrical words, they are focused on practical solutions. Sinn Féin saying today that really this was more bluster from the government. I'm quite relaxed about it. I actually think that this was a case of David Frost uh, posturing for the party faithful. Uh, a lot of sabre rattling, some bluster, but in reality it's not going to impinge on what now needs to happen and that is for the British government to seriously engage through the joint framework with the European Union in order that we can resolve some of the disruption that has been caused by the protocol. So Tracy, when do you see things becoming clearer? Well, we're waiting to find out what the EU's response is to the UK's plan outlined in the command paper at the start of the summer. When that is made clear, I think we'll know at that point whether or not there's going to be a confrontation, whether or not the government will decide to trigger Article 16. We're told that will come sometime this month. So I think November should be quite an interesting month. Tracy McGee in Manchester. Thank you. And tonight on View from Storm, and Tracy will sit down with the Prime Minister the protocol and legacy, and uh, there are just a few of the points put to Boris Johnson. We'll also be hearing from the Deputy First Minister, Michelle O'Neill, on some of the big issues facing the executive, including vaccine passports. That's a view from Stormont tonight at 11 o'clock. Tighter controls on bonfires built on land owned by Belfast City Council could be on the way if a Sinn Féin motion is passed tonight. The move would mean that bonfire organisers would have to go through a rigorous application process. Stuart Robson has the details. Yeah! 
they're a familiar sight on the 11th night, lighting up the skyline. Supporters say they are about culture, but others see them as a source of controversy and a safety risk. That's ignited a debate over regulating bonfires. We see year after year um, these events, the tension they cause in the city, the, the problems they call for, cause for residents who live around them. A motion supported by Sinn Féin and the SDLP was passed at committee stage last month, with unionists and alliance voting against it. But this evening, those proposals could be ratified by the council. In the last number of years in particular, we've seen an increase of, of dangerous fires in the city. Uh, and this motion is designed to put a framework in place, a framework that will make bonfires safer and legal. Um, I mean, we, we see year after year um, these events, the tension they cause in the city, the, the problems they cause for, cause for residents who live around them. Um, so this, this motion is designed to, to legalise bonfires and to bring bonfires uh, into, into streamlining it into, into what normal events would be in our parks. So what exactly is being proposed? Well, if passed, this new guidance would apply exclusively to Belfast City Council-owned land. Applications would have to include permission from the council, public liability insurance and an entertainment licence. No toxic materials, including tyres, could be burnt and no flags, emblems and posters can be displayed or set alight. Those within unionism say the plans are unworkable. There's definitely scope, and this is something that many people were talking about within unionism and loyalism, for voluntary schemes where, whereby there would be a voluntary code of conduct to try and make bonfires uh, as safe and as positive uh, as possible. But, but we're not going to have conditions imposed upon our community by Sinn Féin uh, and, and the SDLP. It's simply not going to happen. The council vote on the motion is currently taking place through those doors behind me, with the result expected later this evening. Stuart Robson, UTV Live at Belfast City Hall. Northern Ireland infrastructure is about to benefit from a cash injection from the Republic. Taoiseach Michal Martin has unveiled the new National Development Plan, which promises €165 billion, Euros, that's approximately £141 billion pounds in funding, for a range of projects, some of which are cross-border. Well, we can join Eden Wilson, who's in Dublin for us this evening. Eden. Yes, good evening, Rose. The Taoiseach, Michal Martin, who in the next half hour will be taking questions from the media just behind me here on this exact story, has described the funding as unprecedented in its scale. The 165 billion euros is part of the Irish government's national development plan. So that's for the likes of housing and infrastructure. But what viewers at home will be most interested in understanding tonight is what is in it for Northern Ireland. Well, the Irish government have set aside one billion euros of that total for the Shared Island Initiative. So that's essentially a grand total now of 3.5 billion euros for north-south projects. So which projects are being examined? Well, project roads that simply connect Northern Ireland to the Republic of Ireland. So looking at railway services, that hourly train between Belfast and Dublin, the long-awaited narrow water bridge project that would better connect the A2 Newry to Warren Point, Jill Carriageway to the south. We have third level education infrastructure up in the northwest and of course the A5 to London Derry Road and that's really only scratching the surface. And Eden, have you any idea when these projects will be completed? Well, this extra €1 billion Euros is set to roll out over the next decade, so really projects could take up to 2030. But I think the effect now of this cash is a show of commitment by the Irish government to rebuild on those cross-border relationships in the wake of Brexit. Aidan Wilson, thank you. A Londonary man accused of rioting on the night Lyra McKee was shot dead has been described in court as a bomb maker for the new IRA. Republican gunman. He's been released on bail. Meanwhile, detectives are questioning a 63-year-old man arrested in Derry this morning. The widower of Michaela Macarivi, who was murdered in Mauritius, has vowed to fight on for justice despite the death of a key witness in the case. Michaela was 27 when she was strangled in her hotel room while on honeymoon in 2011. The County Tyrone teacher was attacked when she disturbed a burglary. No one has been convicted of her murder. Raj Tikoy, who testified to seeing two men accused of her murder leaving her suite, was found dead yesterday. 
The latest stage in the battle over Northern Ireland's abortion laws unfolded in the High Court today. As several pro-life protesters gathered outside, the court heard that the Secretary of State, Brandon Lewis, had no power to boss people about in ordering the opening of abortion services. Despite Westminster's move to decriminalise terminations, such services have yet to be rolled out here. Social media giants Facebook, Instagram and WhatsApp are all down in what's being described as a global outage. From approximately 4pm, the three apps, which are all owned by Facebook, completely stopped working. Thousands of users reported issues with refreshing and loading the sites. Facebook has yet to announce what's behind the problem. Three more patients who tested positive for COVID-19 have died in the last 24 hours, with a further 1,080 cases of the virus confirmed by the Department of Health. Meanwhile, pharmacies are taking over the vaccine rollout across Northern Ireland. It comes as a group of anti-vaccine protesters targeted nurses on a vaccination bus in West Belfast. Well, here's our health reporter, Deborah McAleese. Take the money. Hope you can sleep at night. This is what a team of nurses faced for just doing their job. Users culpable of any political leader taking part in this. A group of anti-vaxxers gathered outside their vaccination bus in West Belfast, shouting abuse and filming them. They left when police officers arrived at the scene. The PSNI said there was no evidence of any offences being committed. But we've been told that staff here yesterday felt frightened and intimidated, with one nurse left in tears. When I got round, one of the nurses was, was really upset and um, because they had... Um, taking some film footage as well. I was really annoyed that the nurses had been set, you know, because these people um, are giving up, a lot of those people are giving up time to go and do the administer those vaccines. And this isn't the first time. Health Minister Robin Swan warned last week that staff at vaccination centres had faced threats of physical violence. The warnings come as the vaccination programme now moves away from vaccine centres to community pharmacies. From today, anyone aged 18 and over can book their first dose of Moderna at one of 130 community pharmacies across Northern Ireland. We took the view that it was very important as um, health professionals in the community to really step up and make our impact on the pandemic and hopefully get us all out the other side as quickly as possible. This is going to be a busy winter period for everybody involved in the health service and particularly for community pharmacy. We have been the open door of the health service in primary care right throughout COVID. And now, as you say, with the additional roles of the vaccination programmes, community pharmacy has a lot on its plate. But the, the network is ready, it's willing and it wants to play a role in these important public health campaigns. Despite the protesters, 174 people still came forward to the vaccination bus at Colin Glen over the weekend to get their first jab. I have to say, whatever they said or done, it didn't stop people getting in. It just, it just really bothers me that these people can do this and there's no, there's no outcome no for, for them. You know, they can just turn up and go away and that's it. More than two and a half million vaccines have been administered to date. And within the next few weeks, the programme will be rolled out in schools for 12 to 15 year olds. Deborah McAleese, UTV Live. Still to come on the programme, it's the mark of a champion. Jonathan Ray bounces back from two crashes to win in Portugal. And Michael Conlon wants justice and his Olympic medal, with his Rio defeat suspected of being fixed. So for that and more, do stay with us. You're welcome back to UTV Live with Paul and Rose. A reminder of this evening's top stories. The trial of an 80-year-old ex-soldier in connection with a trouble shooting begins in Belfast. And the Brexit Minister Lord Frost calls for Europe to respond to protocol demands as the DUP warns the clock is ticking. Well, it's time now to look at the headlines making tonight's ITV News at 6.30. And here's Mary Nightingale. Coming up on the programme, a warning from the Chancellor that the recovery will come at a cost. 
In his big speech at the Tory party conference, Rishi Sunak said more tax rises will be needed to fix the public finances. Also ahead, the military begin delivering fuel to the forecourts, but is it enough to fix the petrol crisis? Plus, the junior doctor and his pet dog that helped him to a top 10 finish in the London Marathon. Will you join me for those stories and more at 6.30? Sports next, Ruth Gorman has the latest. Hughes Insurance sponsors UTV Sport. Good evening. Northern Ireland manager Ian Barraclough has confirmed five players will miss the World Cup qualifiers against Switzerland and Bulgaria. Shane Lavery injured his hamstring after scoring his seventh goal of the season for Blackpool. Trevor Carson, Michael Smith, Ali McCann and Gavin White are also carrying injuries. And it's unsure yet if Johnny Evans will join up with the squad later this week. Now, it was an eventful weekend for Jonathan Ray in the World Superbike Championship in Portugal. After crashing out on Saturday, Ray picked up a victory in Sunday's second feature race to narrow the gap at the top of the championship standings and keep his title hopes alive. Daniel Duffy reports. They say you can't keep a good man down. Despite crashing out of race one on Saturday, Jonathan Ray bounced back on Sunday in his quest for a seventh World Superbike title. With Ray leading the second feature race in Portimao, championship leader top rack Razgat Lioglu crashed out. So the barrier goes, the bike, and it's the Turkish rider who gets it wrong. Our race winner, Jonathan Ray. Ray went on to win the race to close the deficit to 24 points on the Turkish rider in the championship standings. 24 is a lot better than 49. Um, uh, with a lot of races to go, you know, six races. You know, the championship just keeps swinging uh, well, and that's, that gives the, me um, some hope at least. The next round of the championship takes place in Argentina later this month. Daniel Duffy, UTV Live. Well done, Jonathan Ray. Now, Jason Quigley has landed a world title shot. The Donny Goldman will fight WBO middleweight champion Demetrius Andred on November the 19th in New Hampshire. His former training partner, Michael Conlon, is seeking legal advice over the recent report surrounding boxing corruption at the Rio Olympics in 2016. I spoke with him earlier. It's a decision that called into question the integrity of the Olympic Games. Michael Conlon's hugely controversial quarterfinal defeat in Rio is remembered for all the wrong reasons. Up to 10 suspicious matches from the 2016 Games are being investigated, where bout manipulation may have taken place, including Conlon v. Nikitin. I did have emotions when I read a line saying about you know, the referee. It says in, in the article, in the, in the report about the referee of my fate, you know, making sure that Nikita didn't get any further damage, you know, separating this and stuff. And, and I remember saying that in there, like saying to the ref, like, what are you doing? Like, and there's nothing wrong, so let me go. And she kept breaking it up. There's always that what if, and, you know, that chance of creating that history of becoming a, an Olympic medalist, which I'll never get to achieve. To have all this stuff come up again after kind of making peace with it is, it's good in a way, but it was also bad. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not the kind of thoughts you want to be having going through your head again. But when I read the report, I was, I was, I was mind blown. The report by Professor Richard McLaren found that a hand-picked team of top referees and judges used signals at ringside or instructed each other who should win a particular match. It actually needs to happen rather than, you know, talk about it, bring it back up again and do nothing, which happens an awful lot, which has happened an awful lot in that time space from, from five years ago. They brought, this is the second investigation, by the way, so... You know, this is uh, the first one they, they realised that nothing was wrong, but this one they've realised that there's a lot wrong. So, um, yeah, hopefully justice will be served. And, you know, for me, it, the, the minimum part of justice is getting decisions and medals. We shall see. Now Ulster secured a bonus point win against Zebra in the United Rugby Championship. Ethan McElroy's two first half tries got Ulster on their way. Further scores from Will Addison, James Hume and two from Nick Timoney rounded off the scoring. 19-year-old Neil Doak put in an encouraging man of the match performance. Next up for Ulster is Benetton at the Kingspan on Friday night. Ulster wingers Jacob Stockdale and Rob Little could return from injury for that one. 
The Belfast Marathon made its return yesterday following an absence of over two years due to COVID-19. Over 5,000 runners took part in the race which started at Stormont before finishing at Ormo Park. Irish Olympian Mick Cloisey won the men's race while Armagh runner Vanilla Ross won the women's. Well done to all who took part. Now, Crusaders host Coleraine tonight in the Danske Bank Premiership. Cliftonville remain top of the table after a one-all draw with Linfield. Second placed Larne defeated Dungannon 4-2. Carrick moved into third spot with a win over Ballymena, And there were wins for Glen Torren and Portadown. But the best celebration of the weekend came at the Valley, where Greencastle Rovers got a last-minute winner over their Derby rivals, Rath Cool. The goal has been viewed over 300,000 times online. They certainly enjoyed that one. And rightly so. Finally, congratulations to Michael Hoey, who got back to winning ways, taking victory at the Pro-Am at St Andrews Dunhill Links. That is all your sport this Monday. Bye for now. Hughes Insurance sponsors UTV Sport. Now let's check the weather forecast. And Louise has the details. Now you're home. It's right as rain. UTV Weather, sponsored by Phoenix Natural Gas. Hello there, good evening. Most places have had a mix of sunshine and scattered showers today and for the next few days it'll follow a similar pattern but it's going to feel milder midweek before conditions become more unsettled towards the end of the week. Looking at the Atlantic pressure sequence, low pressure from the west moves eastwards overnight bringing rain across southern areas as a ridge of high pressure builds. It will bring warmer air later in the week before a cold front arrives in on Thursday. Any of today's showers will start to die out as we head through this evening. Rain may continue to affect parts of County Down though through tonight, but should clear by morning. Under those clear skies, it will feel quite cool overnight as temperatures dip to single figures. Rural areas may even have a light frost overnight. Tomorrow will start off dry, bright and chilly, but as we head through into the afternoon period, there'll be the odd scattered char here and there, but they will move away quite quickly. It'll be quite a similar day to today with temperatures in the mid to low teens. Across the rest of Ireland, it will be a bright and mainly dry day with sunny spells and isolated showers. It will be a blustery day though, with moderate to fresh northwesterly winds with highs of 14 or 15 degrees Celsius. That is the latest. Have a lovely evening. Home means more sitting back, snuggling up and relax. UTV Weather, sponsored by Phoenix Natural Gas. Beef and Stormont will be on your screen at 11 o'clock. Eden Wilson will have the next local bulletin. That's at 10.45. ITV News continues now with Mary Nightingale. From Paul and me and everybody on the team here at UTV, have a very good evening and we'll see you tomorrow at 6. See you tomorrow.